All right, welcome. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming tonight. We so appreciate it. Um, just a couple reminders just to get through them before we um, go on to our wonderful program. To silence your cell phones, of course. It's always a always something I want to say. Um, and also, um, East City Books will be selling um, Willie's works um, after the program. So they're, they're over here, and Willie will be signing after that. So just something to be aware of after the program. Um, and I will just go ahead and introduce Rob Casper, who will be um, say a little bit more about the speaker. And he is the head of the Poetry and Literature Office. <laughs> Excuse me. <Thank> <laughs> Suddenly I feel like I'm doing a stand-up with this mic stand. Oh, that's I'm a, <clears throat> exciting times here on the um, Hill Center stage. Yes, hi, I'm Rob Casper. I'm the head of the Poetry and Literature Office. Uh, thanks to Laura and, and to Diana Ingram and Charlotte Harper and everyone here at the Hill Center for continuing to host this series, Life of a Poet. And thanks to all of you for coming out at a time when we are told not to congregate in large groups. Luckily, we are an intimate gathering, and um, we're not going to get in any trouble. Uh, Ron, thank you for continuing to do this series. Uh, I'll say more about your greatness in a little bit. <laughs> I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting an idea of how this series goes. Um, before we begin, I would like to tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Office at the Library of Congress. Uh, we put events like this one on throughout the year. Um, I should note that on uh, April 30th, uh, we'll have Joy Harjo, our 23rd Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, in town for her closing event. Uh, we hope you come to that. Uh, to learn more about uh, the events that we put on throughout the year, you can visit our website, loc.gov poetry. Uh, we'd also like to know more about what you think about this series. So to that end, you should have a uh, survey on your seat, if you wouldn't mind filling that out and just leaving it on your seat afterwards, we'll collect them. Uh, I'm excited to let you know that we are pairing tonight's event for the very first time with an educated webin educator webinar with our featured poet. This webinar, which is co-sponsored by the library's Learning and Innovation Office and presented in partnership with the National Council of Teachers of English, will take place tomorrow at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It is free and open to educators. You must register online by 12 o'clock p.m. EST tomorrow to participate. The best way to register is to go to our uh, events page, loc.gov slash poetry slash events, go to uh, the event listing and click on the link. I also want to thank the National Council of Teachers of English, or NCTE, specifically Executive Director Emily Kirkpatrick, and Read, Think, Read Write, Think Org Project Manager Lisa Stormfink. NCTE is the professional home of English and literacy, and through the, the expertise of its members, it has served at the forefront of every major improvement in the teaching and learning of English and the language arts since 1911. To learn more about the organization, uh, and you should learn more about it, uh, you can visit ncte.org. And to learn more about the Library of Congress's educational resources, you can visit our website, lsc.gov slash education. And now, finally, let me tell you about tonight's featured poet, Willie Perdomo. Perdomo is the author of four poetry collections, including The Crazy Bunch, published by Penguin Press and named one of New York Public Library's best books of 2019. He is also the author of two children's books, including Clemente, published by Henry Holt and the recipient of the 2011 America's Award for Children's and Young Adult Literature. Ron will also have a little surprise about a forthcoming book. His other honors include the International Latino Book Award, the Penn Open Book Award, and fellowships from Columbia University, Lucas Arts Program, Lower Manhattan Community Council, and the New York Foundation for the Arts. Perdomo is currently a Lucas Arts Program Literary Fellow and teaches English at Phillips Exeter Academy. I was going to quote the Washington Post in which a certain well-regarded critic wrote that Perdomo's poetry is, quote, so irrepressible, it's hard to imagine any of his books sitting still on a shelf, end quote. 
But I don't have to imagine that same critic sitting down for the next 75 life-changing minutes of conversation with our poet. And with that, please join me in welcoming Willie Perdomo to Life of a Poet. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. This, this is our 24th interview in this series. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is quite informal. I mean, only I can talk, but otherwise it's, quite <laughs> otherwise it's quite informal. If you can't hear, you know, if we start to drift away or if the mics don't work, just raise your hand and call that out. There's no reason for you to sit there and be irritated for 10 or 15 minutes while we get things fixed. So just let us know, would you? I have just read all your work. I am dazzled and amazed, um, and I want to know about the childhood that would produce such a storyteller. Were there a lot of storytellers in your early life? I think so. I think, you know, the primary storyteller would prob probably be my mom. And um, when it comes to, say, a book like The Essential Hits of Shorty Bon Bon, she's probably all over that book because it was she that kind of initiated my curiosity about my uncle. Mm -hmm. um, and whenever we listen to uh, Salsa music together, she would start telling stories about my uncle. Yes. My uncle could have been one of the best. That night he played with Tito Puente, uh, and so on and so forth. But I had never met my uncle. He'd already died? He had died by that point. So he took up a lot of space, narrative space, in the living room, especially when music came on. So I, every time I heard Salsa, I would imagine uh, my uncle playing. And I finally discovered that he had played with Eddie Palmieri's brother, Charlie Palmieri, in 76 uh, in a group called the Sesta All-Stars, and two volumes of that album. And what was unique about these bands is they were big bands. Like eight, 12? Uh, I would say maybe like 14, right? Okay. So in, in other words, it, it was a democratic space to begin with, and everyone got to, got to play. So you heard everyone's voice, if you will. Um, but the real storytellers, I think, for me were, you know, I grew up in East Harlem, um, spent a lot of time as a young person sitting on a stoop. Yes. And that's where you would start to hear epics, really. <laughs> you would hear the legends of playground basketball players. Yes. You would hear uh, stories that were really, like, Cowboy movies, you know. These are things that have been sort of worn over and perfected. I suppose over time. so. I think I think what I finally discovered is that I was surrounded by a group, a collective of top-notch liars, basically. <laughs> uh, and they were good liars, though. I mean, really, really good liars who could plot plot a story. Yes. Who could uh, sectionalize a story, and could actually leave you begging for more, you know. And then those stories started changing. So you go from the stoop, and then you go down to the corner. I live in the city. And then you go from the corner to the front of a store, and then the front of a store down to the subway station. And by the time the story that you heard on the stoop reached the subway station, it was nothing like the story that you had heard, <laughs> because everyone had shipped in along the way. Perfecting it. Yeah, to the story. So what I learned primarily about the storytelling process was that it was not an individual sitting at a desk by themselves yes. telling the story. It was someone who had absorbed a whole bunch of other people telling stories. That is epic. That's the way the stories began. You know, I suppose so, but you never want to pretend to be epic that way. You know, you don't want to say, well, you know, I'm telling an epic tale right, right. now, but, and not deliver the goods. But, um, and then the storytelling kind of picked up once I arrived at school. And so then the relationship to storytelling became more uh, of a relationship that I had with the books that I was reading right. at that point. So th those were all the kind of resources I had for, for, for narrative. This, this sounds like it's jumping out of what you're saying. Uh, not for nothing? Yes. Oh, yeah. So this was a, this was a, uh, this, the, the title of this poem is called Not for Nothing, Honestly and Truthfully. And I had a friend who would, uh, he would preface all his stories with not for nothing, honestly and truthfully. And that's how we knew that he was lying at that point, right? <laughs> so he was like, oh boy, here he goes, he's gonna tell one. So, 
Like jewel thieves, we put everything to the light. Whenever Brother Lowe preambled stories with not for nothing, honestly, honestly and truthfully, we knew he was lying his way into history. Stories started their premises on the stoop, broke arcs by the time they reached the Uptown Express, and the reel was played and buried by the time it got directions. He said, it was like Petey had a lit birthday candle sticking out his right ass cheek. The negus ran all the way to North General. Shamika says she saw a wisp of smoke flirting with the heat. A graph of blood followed west all the way to triage. She started telling stories and hasn't stopped since. Petey jetted to the hospital with a slug below his heart, a skin shot near his calf, a cap in his ass, and don't call it symbolic, Brother Lowe told Skinnicky. A man got to know his wrong even when he's turning blue. You just can't call on the wrong witch. Before Petey went blank, before Petey went black, he saw Nestor's mother cry into a blanket, a calendar with a photo of the White Mountains, a body bent in a wheelchair, a waterfall, and an empty plastic cup. And then the next thing you know, you prayed hard, but you never made promises. The emotional range of that story, the way we started out laughing, and then pretty soon we're all genuinely emotionally concerned right. and alarmed. Yeah. That's yeah. the range of the stories. I think so. I mean, I mean, that was the poem that was actually based on. Uh, uh, and you know, I, I hate to I, I hate to start off the, the kind of narrative background of the poems with a dude who got shot and ran all the way to the hospital, but it was true, <laughs> and you didn't believe it when someone said, "Yeah, man, I heard, you know, he got shot a few times and ran all the way to the emergency room, and here I am on the stoop trying to picture that." Yeah. That doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound possible. But it was quite regular during those years. And that's the reality that I kind of didn't understand until I grew older. That somehow what I was writing about had already been normalized without casting a kind of general net on what it was like to be uh, African American and Puerto Rican at that time because it was a specific place. Right. But you never want to say that this spoke to a larger experience, you know. It was a very specific experience. For it was sure. yours. Yeah. It was yours. You mentioned your mother. I, I think this poem is inspired by her, but if I'm wrong, uh, you can recast it. Oh, man, look at that. So you're going back over here. This is, uh, you know, these are poems I wrote when I was in Ithaca College. I went to Ithaca College for like my first two years, my first attempt at college. Um, I went to Ithaca College and... Uh, well, it's not like they took them out of the trash. I mean, it, you got them published in a book. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah. Well, I dropped out to go be a writer, so okay. mission accomplished, right? But uh, um, So most of the poems, this is a, from a collection called Where Nickel Cost a Dime. And uh, it came out when I was 28, but the poems were really written between 19 and, say, 22, 23. And I wrote this as a uh, kind of tribute to uh, my mom. So it's called Unemployed Mommy. Even though she don't have a job, mommy still works hard. The last 23 years of her life have been spent teaching a poet and killing generations of cockroaches with sky blue plastic slippers, TV guides, and pink tissues. She prays for the poet as he runs into the street looking for images of Boricua sweetniks to explode in his face. The young roaches escape in the dark while my unemployed mommy goes to sleep cursing at them. Even though she don't have a job, mommy still works hard. She walked behind my drunken father in the rain as he stumbled into manhood and oblivion in America wearing his phony mambo king pinky ring. He beat my mommy. He beat my mommy, stopped beating my mommy with the black umbrella, the one with the fake ivory horse head handle. I still hear the same sci -sa blurring out the same social club where I used to fall asleep and dream happy lives. Even though she don't have a job, mommy still works hard. Every year she prays for my abuela who died in a sweet bed of holy water and Ben Gay while the poet was kicking his mother inside her stomach. Mommy looks at Miss America, Miss Universe, Miss Everything every year, and then she runs into her bedroom to dig out her high school yearbook 
from underneath her pile of important papers. Look, Papo, look at your mother when she was 18 years old. She was pretty like those girls on TV. You still are, I say. Even though she don't have a job, mommy still works hard. Lately, she plays slow songs of lost love over and over and over. She looks out the window only when it rains, measuring teardrops against the raindrops. Where is that man, I wonder, as I sit in my room writing and rewriting a poem for her. I catch her peeking at me from the corner of her eye, wondering if I do, I really do love you, and that's not the record, that's me, I say, hugging her with a kiss. Don't cry, mommy, even though you don't have a job, I know you still be working hard. Is your mother still alive? She is. She's heard you perform? Oh, it's, it's uh, you know, I, uh, what I can tell you is that I read this poem one summer in Lincoln Center. And there's a moment when I say she's, uh, the line says, uh, uh, I used to be beautiful like those girls on TV. And then from the audience you hear, I still am, right? So, <laughs> so it was a long time before I could not, I stopped, I kind of disinvited my mom from coming to the reading, so because she took up a lot of space, you know, at the readings. And, uh, but, you know, again, her level of uh, emotional reaction uh, to the poetry was, was something not to go unnoticed. And your understanding and willingness to acknowledge her education of you in that poem is, of course, so sweet and so moving. And your ability to see how hard she worked had nothing to do with whether she was employed or not right. uh, is, is very touching and effective there. Who encouraged you eventually to, you know, actually write poems? It wasn't well, people in your, it wasn't your parents, it wasn't. Well, I think, I mean, the act of writing, the, the, the literal act of writing, again, uh, my mother's a, a journal, avid, uh, avid journal keeper. Oh, okay. She can tell you the weather. Yes. The number that came out, what was playing on TV on the day that my son was born. So I noticed that she was starting to kind of record life as it was happening, you know. As a young, young, young child, though, I remember the, um, the writing going from the left margin to the right margin. She, had this, she has this very beautiful, elegant, cursive it's writing. It's before you could write. Yeah. And it would just fill up the page all the way to the bottom. And then she flipped the page and do it again. So I recall going to, uh, I think I was in first grade, and I took a, a sheaf of drawing paper, I think. And with a pencil, I just do these zigzag lines all the way from left to right, all the way from left to right. And I do it for a few pages, you know. Yes. And I go through it, and I'm like, damn, look at all the stuff I wrote, you yes. know what I mean? <laughs> but there wasn't one word there, That's you know. So that was the first part. I think by the time I got to uh, school, I started going to school downtown. I went to a school called Friends Seminary. And there was, there was a receptionist there whose name is Ed Randolph. They called him the Mad Poet of Harlem. He was a, I later discovered that he was a contemporary of uh, Sekou Sendiata. Oh. And so, you know, I was struggling kind of navigating these two worlds, right? The kind of uptown, East Harlem, black and Puerto Rican world with this primarily white Quaker school. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he saw that. He saw the, that I was kind of getting into these conflicts. Um, one that kind of culminated in, in a fight. And he kind of grabbed me to the side and he said, look, um, you have to do something else with this energy right now. You know, There's ways that you can reroute it. And so I was in like eighth grade, so I had no sense of abstraction when it came to positive and negative flows of energy. I didn't right. know what that meant. Uh, two weeks later, we had an assembly period, and he reads this poem, 
and it was for a friend of his who had just got back from the Vietnam War. And there's this image of his friend running under a bench because he heard a helicopter. And I just, I remember just crying. I was like, what is going on right now? And I was pro probably crying for a whole bunch of other reasons that I wasn't really aware of. But when he did that, I said, that's what he does with his energy. This is what I want to do. Now, mind you, before that, I wanted to be like a corporate banker or a doctor or like <laughs> a lawyer, you know. I wanted my little house on Shelter Island, and yes. that didn't work out, but I said, I want to be a writer. And it was a whole confluence of all these beautiful things happening. My ninth grade teacher had um, a sign, Down These Mean Streets by Perry Thomas. I was in Barnes and Nobles, the old, I think, I, I don't know if it's still there on Fifth Avenue and 18th Street, not there anymore. Shopping for my books. I had a financial aid voucher. And I see this mass market size paperback of the selected poems of Langston Hughes. And it's the one where he's on the cover. It's a publicity shot. Yes. He's in front of the typewriter. He's kind of looking at the camera like a, yes. somewhat quizzically, right? He's mm -hmm. like, all right, go ahead and take the picture, right? <laughs> So I open the book and I see Harlem, I see jazz, I see rent, I see Lenox Avenue, and I was like, this book is for me, right? <laughs> so I just put it on my financial aid voucher even though it wasn't assigned reading. Read the book in the night. So all these things happen. So I come to Ed, I said, look, I think I want to write poems. He says, okay. And the next day, or some, a few days after that, he says, read deeds. And he gives me I don't know why, but he gave me The World of Apples by John Cheever and Leaf Storm by Garcia, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Yes. Wow. Two different writers. Yes. A few weeks after that, he says, listen to this. And this was uh, Jerry Gonzalez's old band, uh, Experimental uh, New Yorkino, the uh, uh, Concepts in Unity, it's called. Yeah. He gave you an album. An album. He said, listen to this. So what I'm telling you, Ron, is that basically that my apprenticeship started. And it wasn't about just reading, but now it was about music. Right. And then it was about art. And then it was about poetry and so on and so forth. So, so he started me, I think, on my path uh, to writing poems. Wow. That's, you've told him, I assume. Oh, yeah. I tell him pretty much <laughs> at least once a year for sure. That is a great story. I want you to read, if you don't mind, just the first page of this okay. poem. Okay. I hate to cut the poems up, but sometimes I have to. So this is, po this is a poem called Spotlight at the New Eurekan Poets Cafe. <laughs> Finally fixed, I get to the cafe in time for my spotlight. I ask Julio the bouncer if he's going to stay inside to hear me read tonight. He says, only if I read something happy. None of that dark ghetto shit because tonight's crowd got him pissed. <laughs> He is the best random judge in the house as he soothes a low-scoring slam poet. Come on, you know you can't take this shit too seriously. Julio strengthens my aesthetic as I walk through the door and spot the spoken word racketeers who get close enough to dig into my pockets when I fall asleep. I just spent my last $10 and they look at me stupid when I ask if they can spare some real change. I was just a poet wanting to read a poem the first night I came here. Since then, I have become a street poet, then somebody's favorite urban poet, a new jack hip hop rap poet, a spoken word artist, a born again Langston Hughes, a downtown performance poet, but you won't catch me rehearsing. My spit is ready made real. Thank you. Tell us about that cafe and its influence on your <coughs> career. Oh, man, the cafe. And other people's careers, too. I, you know, I, again, I was, uh, this story also kind of starts out in Ithaca. Ithaca is kind of famous, well, at least it used to be, for having, for being a, a haven for, for, for writers. I didn't know that again until later. And they had these great used bookstores. And I was in one of them one day, and I look up. And at the very top, uh, 
It's the original New Yorican anthology that was put together by Miguel Algarín and Miguel Pinero. And it was almost as if I had like wings. I just flew up and I just <laughs> picked it out. Of course, I said, I need that book up there, you know. And again, it's that experience of finding that book that you really have needed for a very long time, you know. That was in 87, I think. By 91, I was in front of the New York <laughs> Poets Cafe, reading poems out loud. And my favorite moment of that whole experience, beyond the travel, because I got to see a lot of the world and a lot of the country as a young poet, which was pretty cool. One night I was, uh, I was reading and I was on stage. And I looked to my left. And at the bar, you could see basically the vanguard of New Rican poetry. It was Pedro Pietri, Miguel Algarín, and then Bimbo Rivas. And they were all looking at me like that as I was reading. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's them. These, these are the poets who I read about. Yes. And my favorite po uh, moment was when Pedro came up to me and says, you're one of us, man. I was like, yeah, I am, right? So and it was a good moment, I think. I think the New Rican really, what it did for me was, again, it expanded my sense of language. It made the New York experience real for me uh, in terms of how I was going to approach it with my poetry. Mm -hmm. Most of the poets who were coming out of the New Eureka movement understood the role of poetry as it relates to an audience, a live audience, and reading it out loud. Mm -hmm. They understood the role of poetry as it, how it connected as a tool for the community. Right. And refreshingly, too, there was a sense of how to navigate one being Puerto Rican, but also being black at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so what you see is the languages kind of flowing into these poems. I think Amy, Amy Tan calls them the, her Englishes. Yeah. And I was using all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what the New Rican kind of, kind of gave me. And that and the kind of presence in front of an audience that could be kind of dangerous too, right? Um, um, you once described, several times you described writing poems as walking along a ledge high off the ground. Yeah, it's a lot like that, except reading them out loud is like falling off that ledge, <laughs> basically, you know? And, uh, and I've done that quite a few times. Rest in peace, there, was a, there used to be a, a poet, uh, his name is Steve Cannon. And, uh, and you couldn't, and Ed, this is something that Ed told me, you couldn't really preamble too much in terms of giving the poem away. You see a lot of poets giving the background to the right. poem. And sometimes the story ends up being a little bit better than the poem, right? <laughs> so Ed says, you never want to do that when you get up to read a poem. And then I understood why when I got to New York and Poets Cafe, because Steve Cannon, who was blind, would sit in the back of the bar and if you were one of those poets who liked to kind of pontificate and get up there and, and talk about what went into the poem and its connection to the New York School of this and New York School of the other, all you heard was, read the goddamn poem already. <laughs> and that was it. And you had to read it. So that, again, is, is good kind of practice to be outside of yourself and to understand that writing poems like the storytelling process is not an individual process. Yes. It's a community process. It's a, it's a space where it's no longer about I, it's about we, because we are in it together at this point. And you get a kind of immediate reaction back. Uh, very immediate. <laughs> very, very immediate. You see what Because works. back in those days, you know, it was, it was a very underground thing, so it wasn't, it wasn't uncommon for folks to just get up and start cursing oh. while you were reading a poem. Right. Once it got popular, then you had to, you know, it, there was a little bit of, uh, I suppose, respectability that came with it. But when it was underground, it was a little different reading those poems out loud, for sure. Because it was still a whisper in New York, you know. Right. No one really knew about it. Do you have a sense that certain poems should be performed and certain poems should be read silently? Or is that an nah. artificial distinction? No, nah. I, think, I think all my poems start out quiet. They start out with that moment of me being being silenced mm -hmm. or choosing to be quiet. 
That's where they start. They start with me walking down the street and kind of noticing an image, you know. All right. Uh, I saw a hat the other day about, yes, it was yesterday, I saw a hat on the street, it was a scully cap, and the brim said NY, but it was on the, it was on the street. I'm like, how did that, that hat get here? Right. Now, clearly, someone could have dropped it, but for me, I'm going to run with that a little bit more, right, like how that hat, hat got there. So, and then once I write the poem, that's when I'm starting to read it out loud. To hear it yourself That's first. right, just to see how, mm. how it sounds coming back. How, if I'm being a little bit too wordy, where I might be repeating myself a little bit. So I think they go hand in hand. I can't afford as a poet in the world to force a binary into the process where it has to, either it has to be written or it has to be read aloud. For me, they exist together. They right. have to. Right. Yeah. I, I see that as I read them soundly, and it's very effective, and then here you read them and also effective in other ways. Uh, in that first book, Where a Nickel Costs a Dime, early in that collection, which is funny and caustic and challenging, uh, there's a line about your identity. Hey, Willie, what are you, man? Oh, man. Remember that? That line? Yeah. How has your answer to that question evolved? Uh, what are you, man? I contain multitudes, right? So I, <laughs> I, uh, Wait, I, I'm not to write that yeah, down. I, uh, uh -huh. Yeah, I, uh, I'm not just one thing, right? That's the, beauty, yes. that's the beautiful part about it. No You've matter come how, to this. Right, no matter how the forces at play, be they education, correctional, uh, medical even, um, circumscribe you to these specific identities whereby, you know, you're allotted a certain amount of resources. So. Right. That poem again started in Ithaca. And now I can't I can't read this poem aloud. It has a really good story behind the poem. Can I use the N-word in it? It's in the title, I think. Yeah, it's in that's, the title. That's I why get I away with the it. title. Yeah, I could not get <clears throat> away with it. And there was uh there was a sister who was a grade below me at Ithaca. Her name is Tanya, Tanya Ewan. And I came out of a, of a dorm, and she said, Willie Perdomo, my Enrican brother. I was like, oh. Her perception of me at that point was that I was not only Puerto Rican, but I was African American. But how that word is tied into those identities became complex. Yes. Perry Thomas had struggled with this. He didn't know he was black until he went down south. That I was already in tune with. Mm -hmm. The beautiful part about this poem is that it had become benchmark by the time I was, I wrote it when I was 19, and it's still making the rounds. Mm -hmm. I was about 22 years old, I recall, and Suhair Hamad says, you need to come down to Hunter College because Perry Thomas is here. I was working in a literary agency at that point, and I remember I had a jacket on. I think I was going to some event. I had a shirt and my tie. I was ready to meet Perry. So I get to Hunter College, and he's up on stage. Now, here I am. I'm like 22, and this is my hero, at least one of them. And he says, I'm going to read a poem by a young poet who's in the crowd tonight. Wow. Yeah. But before he read that, he read... Pedro's poem, Puerto Rican Obituary, which is iconic. And then he read my poem. And I'm dumbstruck. I'm like, here's my hero reading my poem, and he's doing a terrible job of doing the poem, by the way. <laughs> I mean, he's really messing the poem up. But I sit through it. Now, Ron, for the next 40 years, no, for the next 30 some odd years, I'm having problems with this poem real problems. I'm also having some conflict about where Perry's heading in, in his writing life. Right. I have been, by this point, I have been to his house for dinner a few times and hung out with him. So we flash forward, man, 30 years later. And I'm, I'm in his living room in El Cerrito. And he has dementia. And he has sunglasses on, and he's sitting on a reading chair with a cane, and he's looking out toward the mountains. And he says, he used to call me Negrito. He said, Negrito, he says, um, read that poem to me, the one uh, 
the one about you being uh, black and Puerto Rican. So now, that means that in this world, in this poet life, that means that a poem has a natural life cycle. Because when he read it to me, when I was 22, I read it back to him 30 years later in the living room. And then at that point, I was at peace with the poem, and I was at peace with him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How do you describe yourself now? Well, I'm definitely Puerto Rican. <laughs> I'm definitely black. Um, I'm a man, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a teacher, I'm a writer, I'm a poet. My identity really started becoming a little bit more, I would say, fluid ethnically when I started traveling to Europe for the poems. Mm -hmm. When I start, started traveling outside of America, and people really didn't understand what it meant. If I said I was Puerto Rican, they couldn't tell you what that meant. Right. Um, because I was being mistaken for being Middle Eastern. Oh. I was being mistaken. I think someone thought I was Sicilian at that point, given my last name. Mm -hmm. All that to say, again, that where you are, you know, who you are, sometimes can be dictated by where you are. Yes. And what you ultimately discover is that you have to take control of how you are defined. And that's a powerful moment uh, because you don't give someone else that control. That's a life's work. That's right. Um, and so I would say I'm embracing all my identities at this point. And again, they're not really separate. Mm -hmm. They inform each other, I think, in many ways. You would, and you have no objection to being identified with a particular place, with, with Spanish Harlem. Oh, hell no. No, man. no, no. The way Eudora Welty no, and no. Faulkner are identified with particular yeah, places. Yeah, I, I live in New Hampshire right now, but I'm still from East Harlem, yeah. right? Like, I'm, you know, and that never stops. I think, you know, I don't know if you know the, um, the, the percussion is Poncho Sanchez. No. We were at a, he was playing at Yoshi's, uh, the old Yoshi's in Fillmore, which is no longer there. Mm -hmm. And he was playing a set. They played a whole set. My friend and I went for a drink at a place next door. Boncho's there with his band. We sent him a drink. He says, thank you. I was like, yo, man, your, your set was, was dope tonight. It was the bomb, blah, blah, blah. I, keep, I, t I tell him, this is a percussionist now. He hears me talking to him. He says, you from East Harlem, ain't you? Really? You know what I'm saying? You're from East Harlem. I can hear it. You are. The accent yeah, or the, the vocabulary? The accent, the vocabulary, the way I was talking with my hands, all of it. He was like, he was like you're from East Harlem. And that right there told me that there was, there was something specific. Yes. Because this is a drummer. Yes. Who's hearing a block. Like Henry Higgins. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so at that point, it felt like, no, I have no problems at all being identified with a, with a, with a certain place in New York. Yeah. So this is a poem that's often used now in the, as a writing prompt. It's the, the where I'm from prompt. <laughs> and this started in, uh, this started in Ithaca too. Um, I had a roommate. No, I had a floor mate. I lived on the fourth floor of, a, of the towers, they used to call them, right? And I had my own room. And there was, a, there was a kid there from Louisville who had a affinity for calling me Wilbur. Wilbur? Yeah, I don't know why. I was like, my man, my name is not Wilbur, it's Willie, you know? So he got that. I was like, Wilbur. He says, uh, where are you from? So the only decoration that I had in my room was a poster of the New York City subway at the time. And I point to 125th Street, I said, that's where I'm from. So that's where the poem started, where I'm from. Because she liked the kind of music that I played and she liked the way I walked as well as the way I talked, she always wanted to know where I was from. I'm from New York. Where in New York? Manhattan. Where in Manhattan? 
Spanish Harlem. Spanish Harlem? If I said that I was from 110th Street and Lexington Avenue, right in the heart of a transported Puerto Rican town where the jodedores live and night turns to day without sleep, do you think what she might know where I was from? Where I'm from, Puerto Rico stays on our minds when the fresh breeze of cafe con leche y pan con mantequilla comes through our half-open windows and under our doors while the sun starts to rise. Where I'm from, babies fall asleep to the bark of a German shepherd named Tarzan. We hear his wandering footsteps under a midnight sun. Tarzan has learned quickly to ignore the woman who begs her man to stop slapping her with his fist. Please, baby, please, papi, por favor, I swear it wasn't me. I swear to my mother, mommy, her dead mother told her that this would happen one day. Where I'm from, Independence Day is celebrated every day. The final gunshot from last night's murders followed by the officious knock of a warrant squad coming to take your bread, coffee, and freedom away. Where I'm from, the police come into your house without knocking. They throw us off rooftops and say we slipped. They shoot my father and say he was crazy. They put a bullet in my head and say they found me that way. Where I'm from, you run to the hospital emergency room because some little boy spit a razor out of his mouth and carved a crescent into your face. But you have to understand, where I'm from, even the dead have to wait until their number is called. Where I'm from, you can listen to Big Daddy retelling stories on his corner. He passes a pint of light Bacardi, pouring the dead's tributary swig onto the street. His philosophy is quite simple. I'm the, gun, I'm the god when I am put a gun to your head. I'm the judge and you're in my courtroom. We laugh when he makes us the hero in his stories. And some of us wait until no one is looking so we can cry because the price we paid for manhood was too expensive. Where I'm from, it's the late night scratch of rat's feet that explains what my mother means when she says slowly, bueno, mijo, eso la vida del pobre. Well, son, that is the life of the poor. Don't get scared. Where I'm from, it's sweet like my grandmother reciting a quick prayer over a pot of hot rice and beans. Where I'm from, it's pretty like my niece stopping me in the middle of the street and telling me to notice all the stars in the sky. That is a lot more beautiful and a lot more horrible than most of us would expect any place to be. Right. There's some terrible things described in that poem. Yeah. But some really wonderful things, too. Yeah. You're, you're trying to expand our sense of what that place is uh, in the most powerful way. I think that's so, so beautiful. You, you talk about yourself. Uh, in your most recent collection, you say poems were falling from the rooftops, flailing out of windows. Sometimes you pick up the corner payphone and a poem would be calling collect. <laughs> uh, it is funny. Uh, and it is only true if, if you're a poet. I mean, the rest of us walk around and we don't, we don't see the poems falling out. And, and that was in the day of like when you actually had payphones yes, on the street, too, too, right? So. That, too. Right. But I mean, you see these poems. I mean, they may be there, but we're not, I mean, most of us don't have that kind of perception. You've talked about yourself as, as a, the keeper of dreams, mm. as uh, bringing these sometimes dead friends back to life. Mm. I mean, there is a strong nostalgic impulse running through your poems. Yeah. Would you acknowledge that? I think so. I, and I'm quite comfortable with that. You know, there's that moment where uh, I had a, a friend, a friend of mine just said that uh, it's a book that he keeps nearby, I think on the bed stand, night table, so that he can keep, if he ever, he ever wanted to recall that time in our lives, that the book is there, right? right? So what does that mean? That that means that the book becomes a kind of living document. Right. It becomes a, it becomes a history. And um, the way I looked at being a poet in the world and, is that there was, there had to be room for truth and beauty. Right. That it could not be one tone. That like me, it is a lot of things. You can't just point at and say it's just a single thing. Right. Um, but this last book came to me in a kind of in a in a kind of heat. And I remember watching this Nas documentary called Time is, Time is Illmatic. I think it was on HBO. Time is what? Illmatic. What's that word? Uh, it's, uh, his album was called Illmatic. It came out okay. right around the same time, I remember, that where Nickel Call Sedan came out, about 96 or so. Okay. 
So here I am in this house in New Hampshire. It's the first house I ever lived in. And I'm sitting next to my wife and we're watching it. And I get up at the end of it and the credits are rolling and I'm in tears. And I, and I say, I said, baby, I said, I'm back. And I ran to my study. <laughs> and I wrote, you remember that was the summer of Up Rock, Quarter Water, Jesus Pieces, Two for Five, uh, and Bamboo. Some would have said that the science was dropped on our summer. The, the Willy Bobo was turned up to 10, and some would have said that the science was dropped on our summer. The lines came out like that. I mean, it was just fluid. And what that told me is that well, there was someone on the other side that was asking me, yo, when you, when you gonna write that book about the crew? Someone, you mean the other side of death? Uh, yeah, well, that and the other side of New Hampshire, somewhere in New York, <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Like, out the window, right? <laughs> right, because dig it. Like, the, the, it's funny to be, you know, here you are, you're looking out your study, you're looking at the trees, there's a cupola there, the birds are flowing, the crows are calling, and it's like, but you're still on 123rd Street somewhere. <laughs> so now the poems become a kind of transportation. And um, so it was someone asking me, when are you going to write about the crew? The lines came out just like that, and it never stopped, because I knew that every line that came after that had to have that same pitch, had to have the same syntax, diction. All of it had to come into play. And it had to, there had to be music there. It got so bad, Ron, that I was up in Montalvo which is the, where I do the, my Lucas Arts Literary Fellowship. And here, again, is uh, the Montavo Art Center is in a villa in Northern California. And they have these studios that are kind of devoted to artists, a couple of literary artists, musicians, painters, sculptors, and so on. There's only about mm, eight of them. So here I am in my studio. Again, there's no city to be found. There's no metropolis to be found. And I'm working on my book. I have a little gin as well. And, and now I'm listening to music, and I'm dancing with my book, and I'm rewriting I'm, as I'm dancing. And I'm, next thing I know, it's like 6 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning, and I broke night with my book. I, I hung out <laughs> with my book. It was the most beautiful thing ever. Of course, I can't do that every day. I'll be dead at this point. <laughs> right? be like, but I had to tap into that kind of energy when I was working on that bit book to tap into the memory. Yes. And the memory, the more I wrote it, the more real it became. I want to get back to that point. Yeah. I want you all to stand up and then sit back down. <laughs> Just resettle yourselves. We've all gotten too comfortable. <clears throat> this is not an intermission. Now sit back down. <laughs> the yeah, people I you're writing about, some of them are dead. Yeah. But more than that, the place is just not the same. I mean, you go back to Spanish Harlem, it looks nothing like what you, it was like when you grew up, right? Mm -mm. It's all million dollar condos and fancy salad restaurants. Uh, so you're really going back to people and place. In a, in a way, it's kind of a, it's a refurbishing, a reverse, uh, well, you're recollecting a place that's gone. Yeah, I, th I think what's interesting about the recollection is the role that imagination takes place, that takes place in that process, right? Because you are remembering a set of specific images, right. events that actually happen. Mm -hmm. But then they're starting to expand because, again, as you're hanging out with the book, you're also hanging out with the people in the book. And they're telling you, oh, no, it didn't happen that way. You remember that he was walking down the street. And suddenly, again, you're not by yourself kind of writing the book, right? Um, and it's, you almost forget that the East Harlem you knew is no longer there until you come back from New Hampshire to visit and be like, oh, wow, my block is no longer here. It's gone. What remains are the skeletons in the form of buildings, you know? Um, and it reminds me of kind of Lorca run, walking down the street when he was uh, a student in Columbia. You know, he liked, he loved to walk uptown. And suddenly these monsters, I mean, these buildings start to turn into kind of these monsters and living things, you know. And you, 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 you sort of get the same feeling. But I can still catch moments of that time in East Harlem Generally after midnight, 
generally north of 96th Street, mm -hmm. generally in some social club where they serve rum and plastic cups, basically, you know, and yeah. where they still play music that you can dance to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You read Come Back? <clears throat> come Back. When you come back home, you expect welcome mats of, damn, where you been? You look good. Is there something I can do for you? Is there anything you need? But these are the same mats you stepped on before. When you come back home, you expect the spotlight to be as bright as the last time you left the stage, but the page has turned and you got left out the next chapter. Some doors are still left open with loved ones who never gave up knowing that one day you would get it right. They're scared to give you too many hugs because they don't want to enable you again, but they want to stay informed, so they ask questions about your steps, and all you can say is that you closed your eyes, took one giant step, and never looked back. When you finish getting the love you dreamed of getting, you come home and clean your closets, making sure to keep the phone nearby just in case you bump into half of something that will bring you back and hit you where it hurts. How do you get the sound of the language right when you go back, not just in time, but in geography? How do you make, how do you recollect the, the rhythm of those characters? Because I know who I'm talking to, right? I know who I'm talking to in the poems. I know who's there when I'm reading the poems out loud. I know who's there when I'm writing the poems. I know who's asking me to, to remember. If I'm specific enough, the beautiful thing about being a part of a community, even if you're a, the poet in the crew, Yes. And that was your role at that the time. That was my role. Have you ever seen the movie Cooley High? I was Creech <laughs> in the role. I was there. What were the other guys? Uh, there was the basketball player, Cochise. There was the kid who had all the lies down. He was the Romeo dude. I forget his name, but uh, he had, he had, you know, he, he, he was uh, a Lothario. He was uh, <laughs> of the crew. He, uh, there was the younger kids who always wanted to hang out. There were... Uh, and then the common sense kids who were like, I'm not going anywhere near that car right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm chilling here. And so I became, uh, you know, the poet um, in the crew. And the beautiful thing about being the poet in a group, that when you're making these references in the poems, you know that there's someone in the crew who reads a lot, but they won't tell you. <laughs> and they know all the references that you're making, all yes. of them. And there's also someone who's, starting, who's studying to be a PhD, but they still want to hang out, <laughs> right? So there's, there, again, that's the general kind of makeup of your audience at that point. So that's why the language is very specific. And the risk that you take in that process is that you know that there was there'll be some readers that might be left out, but that's okay, right? Because you right. probably won't get all the readers, right? Uh, at that point, so that speaks to the, the the concrete level of the language, how it's influenced by the music of the time, and again, who is on the other side of the story. And this is written. Uh, to capture a single weekend. It was. In the late 90s? In the late 90s. When one of you died. There was a couple who died in that weekend in the book. Right. Yeah. I wonder if you'd read uh, number 12, uh, In the Face of What You Remember. Right. That so kind of th so this, is, this is the first stanza, is the stanza that actually came out when I first started writing the book. In the Face of What You Remember, which of course is taken from a, a Langston Hughes poem, when you look into the face of what you remember. Remember that line, I forget the poem, but um, in the face of what you remember. You remember that was the summer of up rock, quarter water, speed knots, pillow bags, two for five, Jesus pieces and bamboo. The willy bobo was turned up to 10 and some would have said that the science was dropped on our summer. The summer that was lit with whispers of wild style, rock steady battles and white party plates made all kinds of moons on the playground foam. The sum of the burner was used to eat and mandate, inspired Sunday sermons, became a literary influence with humming climaxes, a bribable tale, a dub tied to a string, and squashing beef wasn't an option. The summer of fresh shrills and a future somersaulting off a monkey bar, a future placing bets that all us old heads, desperate to find a new cool, could not flip pure. 
That was the summer that our grills dropped to below freezing. Back then, Palo Viejo was thermal and therapy. Bones were smoked in the cut, and you had to expect Jungle Jim Giggle to be accompanied by Buckshot. That was the summer Charlie Chase hijacked Megawatch from Rose's kitchenette, found gems in a milk crate, spun his one and twos below rims that still vibrated with undocumented double dunks. The same summer we became pundits and philosophers, poets and pushers that we all tried to fly, but only one of us succeeded. The summer that Papu turned up to extra status, the only one in the crew who had reduced fame's window by a fifth when the camera panned his Kazal laced up rock in the Roxy scene of Beat Street. One could say we gave the block gasp and gossip, body and bag, a folk tale worth its morphology. That was the season we had reason to rock capes and wings, chains and rings. Some of us flew higher than most, and tricks were hardly ever pulled from a hat. All that and a bag of barbecue bontons was enough for at least one of us to say, I'm straight. That just jumps off the page. I mean, that, that's just uh, some great writing. Uh, <laughs> the first stanza came to you uh, in a moment of inspiration, but then to try and make all the other standards match that in both tone and immediacy uh, is the work of, of real yeah. effort, co self-conscious effort. Yeah, yeah. Right, so it didn't seem as hard, which was puzzling to me. Like, again, it came, some people think that it comes, you know, the, the common image is that it was like a, the floodgates. Right, like Kublai Khan. Opening. Yes. All you need is enough buckets and sometimes you just don't have enough <laughs> yeah. right yeah this one came more like a fire through a building basically <laughs> you know and you were like all right take me i'm ready to burn at this point uh, and that's what it felt like i knew that it was crackling at that point all right i knew that it was hot and i knew that that summer weekend was the summer weekend that was really going to be the one that changed these kids in the book. And it wasn't just, it was a culmination of all these summers that we had experienced condensed into this one weekend. Uh, the book is made up of many poems, but the poems, I mean, they work as a whole, as a, as a, like a novel, yeah. even, even more than a collection of short stories. That's, would. The, that's the whole, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you think of the way iTunes has destroyed albums. Uh, <laughs> the, the, these poems, I mean, they work by themselves, but they're great together. You have to read them together. Yeah, as yeah. an album, like. But what about the poetry cops? I, I mean, know, that is right, weird. Where they came from? I, I, again, the, the interview, the, the interview with the writer is a fascinating thing. I think, right? For me, I, right? Um, which is why uh, I was looking forward to this because I heard you were thorough. They don't know what they're we're talking about. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. They don't know what we're talking right, about. Right, right. So, but he's got I, like these dialogues in so here. So there's these dialogues in the happen. poetry cops, and, and the he's poetry, being interrogated. Right. The poetry cops stand for um, consolidated poetry systems. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this outfit that talks to Papo. The poet. The poet in the group. And they're looking at a photo album. And the first question is, who's there in that picture? Yeah, what's wrong with his eyes? Right. And so they keep going back and forth where they try, and this was something that I noticed that happened with the Central Park Five. That moment where there's a body, a collective, that is trying to force a narrative onto you, mm -hmm. but they're so far from the truth because they need the narrative for their own purposes, right. whether it's to feel comfortable or convict, mm -hmm. right? At that moment, it felt like there was a similar process going on in that the poetry cops were trying to tell me what happened. And Papo was telling them, look, even if I knew, I couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to try my best right now to kind of recall in bits and pieces. Because my tradition as a writer is to put all those broken pieces together. Right. So when they start asking these questions, I'm starting to think, all right, what can I tell them that will not give it away? I can't tell you how this one perished. I can't tell you who did it. 
but this is what I remember in the face of what I remember. That's a brilliant and daring thing to do, to interrupt the flow of these poems with these Oh, I was taking all kind of risks with the book. I didn't care anymore <laughs> at that point. I, it felt good. It uh, felt, I felt free. It, it's a real innovation to interrupt the flow of these poems. I mean, that appears, what, six times in yeah. this book? The poetry cops, dialogues, interrupt. Little pages of interrogation. Yeah. Contentious, but not violently contentious. No. Uh, it's, it's incredibly clever, and, and you just have to read it for yourself. It just came out last year, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, why don't you read another one of these poems, Well, To get more sense of the language of this, of this mm -hmm. book. Uh, Dapper Dan. Dapper Dan. So, uh, so you know, Dapper Dan is this iconic figure in Harlem. And I knew, I don't know him personally, but I remember his shop on 125th Street, and it would be busy throughout the day, the morning, and so on. And it was basically folks who were in the culture, there was celebrity, hip hop uh, culture, some big time hustlers that would come through and they would get these outfits custom made to their specifications. And Dapper Dan was the only one and is the only one in New York City who could pull it off. Mm -hmm. So one night, it was on Lexington and there was it was Dapper Dan coming through, and there was a big dice game. And Dapper Dan pulled out a knot of money, and the game just got bigger and bigger and bigger. It was like a spectator sport almost. And so this is called Dapper Dan Meets Petey Shooting CeeLo. The forecast calls for the rawness, a litany of daps and pounds, Denim two pieces, bucket hats, and velour track suits. This is before the world went 2.0. You use the word money like pretty Tony, I got money, I got money, or Tony Rome, I want my money, or Kizak Wizak, what's good money, or like Rehab Roger, who upon dishing a concept would say, I'm giving you good money, man. Having just finished shooting trips, P.D. gripped a palm full of Grants and Benjamins, and his pupils were dilated to the riches. Street games fade one dream into another. You bet on your best hope and what you're going to do with all that Skrilla fluttering in the oval. Andrew sorted his ducats, kept the faces on his bills skyward. Fat Phil's inside pocket was packed with penny candies. You always knew where, the, where there was a price for head cracks. A legion of old schoolers flanked the bank, Black Rob, Hollywood from a bunch of grapes, Crip and Spy, Gong and Papo, steady flashing knots, still opening spots. By that time, Hollywood's total net in dirty money had reached short of a million were it not for the million and one shorts he took. You had to be laced to shoot. The clack of die, shoot. You stir fine, you shoot. Hollywood said I would if I could. Dapper Dan was just walking down Lexington on his way to his shop on 125th Street, a fresh LV stitched into his Stacy's, a clutch to match, and asked, who got the bank on a whim? Because the day always comes when you have to put the past up for grabs, where really you learn that sometimes you get dressed up just to lose. The whole book's like this. It's just, <laughs> you got to buy this book. Uh, you, uh, the book runs through what, like seventy-eight hours, I guess. Yeah, yeah. it goes from a Friday to a to a Sunday. Uh, seeing different Sunday characters, night. they come and go. Yeah, they go to a Sweet Sixteen. Right. They go to the Old Times Square. Does it rain? Uh, they watch. Huh? It rains. Oh, there's rain there. That on Friday there's rain where they go to. Uh, they go get uh, what we call preparaciones, basically where the elders in the community. Uh, if they found out that you were in a little bit of trouble, they would, uh, they would prepare you. And that preparation basically was a mix of Catholic and Yoruban traditions uh, that really went on in living rooms all over East Harlem around that time. Yeah. 
Try and get you back in the... Uh, at least some protection while you go back out and do whatever it is you <laughs> have to do. But, you know, you feel somewhat looked over. <laughs> there's nothing like feeling like there's someone on the block outside of your family members who care for you, right. who are invested in you. So these mo there are these moments of comedy. They, ha they would have to be. Yeah, yeah. And sweet moments. And they would have to be, yeah. Just shockingly violent moments and tragic moments. It was part of it. It was part of it. I think that was what I think brought me to uh, tears at the end of the movie, that, of that movie, that the idea of the possible trauma that my generation had experienced you spoke of behind it. Uh, I can't remember the right term you use. Uh, traumatic hood disorder? Post-traumatic hood disorder, but that's from a, a book by a poet named David Tomas Martinez, so I kind of that's from lifted him. that from him. Yeah. What, do you, what does it mean? I suppose that, you know, how one comes into one's personhood, how one becomes a human being without going through hell, mm -hmm. How is one exposed to a level of violence without falling into the trap of normalizing it? Right. Um, and to understand that there are much, much larger forces at play that are kind of making the violence happen. Everything from not being able to read to not being able to have a job. But again, the schools are underfunded. So you can't get the textbooks. You can't get the special tutors. Um, you know, the whole idea of the industrial complex, the prison industrial complex, and how there's a kind of straight, bright line from school to the prison. That's right. been established already. Right. Um, so these are forces that I think would have to be recognized to kind of contextualize a conversation about a book like this and where the violence is stemming from, right. you know? Yeah. Would you close by reading They Won't Find Us in Books? Yeah. Because we found them in books. We found, we sure did. Thank you. Um, so this is toward the end of the book, uh, and it's called They Won't Find Us in Books. Um, and there's a, there's a profanity. Uh, we can take it. We're all adults. Cool. So I don't, it wouldn't work without it, so, but... Uh, they won't find us in books. And after we officially gained entry into the brotherhood of bad motherfuckers, what could our mothers do but lose sleep, wake into prayer, prepare herbs and apples, cursive the names of our enemies on loose leaf, and let their names dust in the sunlight? Now everything is clean, rezoned and paved, Tenements abandoned like whack parties. What is left for us to do but summon bullies from their graves and liberate ourselves from influence? Gone are the old spots near the takeout, old flames where we used to make out, the spots where the light used to fade out and the letters we wrote from burning buildings. Our shoulders were made of stone. Our evil was translucent. Turn us into mortals so we can cry without judgment, surrender our cool, and watch us morph into men. Let it be known that we chased killer dealers before the cans got kicked for good. We were made from repeating blocks. Holler if you hear us. There was never a once upon a time because all it takes is one person to get away with it, to get away and get over, to get some and get up. Here we go. Come on. Here we go. You are history, you said. If being free means burning a few things, then play that number for a straight. The corner was between us and the world and sometimes you just needed to be okay with not telling. If anyone asks you about your destiny, don't explain. Maybe this is the story we need to turn ourselves into music, bass and bully, a string pulling at both ends. They won't find us in books, you used to say. Everybody say, yeah, 
and you don't stop. We practice our lives in lobbies and layaway, ganders and goofs, boosting lines from the radio, breaking dynamite styles. We were God bodies. We had God in our bodies. That's what Brother Lowe used to say. He used to say, a man can stand on the corner long enough to see a dream etched on a herb's forehead, to see desperation exit from a subway station, to see a tragic hero come back to reclaim his city. So we've downloaded his bars and gems, and no doubt when it was time to tell our story, out would come fire and spit. Thank you. It's such a such a pleasure to have you Thank here. Thank you, Ron. Really, really enjoyed.